Greetings, everyone. Uh, you know, thanks to all of our listeners tuning in today. This is your co-host, uh, Dervin from Synonyms of Sound. And this is your other co-host, Tony. And I would like to introduce the Honorable Shannon Friesen, um, who's going to be our host today, um, our guest today. Hello. How are you? Thank you for having me on. We're very, yeah, very excited to have you on today. So um, I'm going to kind of just kick things off. Um, and, um, you know, I took a look at your profile um, on LinkedIn and, and saw that you are a Harvard graduate, also in the military. Could you kind of give me a sense of which came first? Because I think on LinkedIn it showed that you, you wrapped up your Harvard degree in 1992 and joined the military in I think 1994, is that correct? Or were you doing them both simultaneously? No, I did um, finish college um, at Harvard, did my undergraduate there uh, mm -hmm. before any military service. So <clears throat> I went from Harvard to Georgetown for law school. And during law school was when I joined the Marine Corps. Got it, okay. So I guess the reason why I'm asking that question, I feel like someone graduating from Harvard, they automatically get a, a golden ticket to any company, any job that they want. So what would have compelled you to want to go to the military? And, and that was what was really a mystery for me because I feel like you have such a great profile. So why the military? Um, I think the military is a part of a great profile. I agree. And I, uh, during my training, had many people that I would train with ask me that question. By the time I was on active duty and in training, I was, um, had already graduated from Harvard, had, um, was in the middle of school at Georgetown and was in the judge advocate program. So I was mm -hmm. about to be a lawyer. And uh, many people asked me that same question and usually my answer was the same, which was I'm drawn to the Marine Corps by the same things that draw every Marine to the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. The first is the uh, desire to serve the country. And mm -hmm. that is, I think, the most significant part. And people do that in all sorts of ways. When I was in law school, I you know, sort of looked around and said, okay, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm likely to pass. <laughs> if nothing terrible happens, I'm going to be a lawyer at some mm -hmm. point. And I was proud of that and happy about that. But I also wanted a second career. And mm -hmm. I wanted the second career to be at least partly physical in nature. Mm -hmm. And um, I found out about the judge advocate programs and the one uh, that the Marine Corps does in particular and sort of never looked back from there. It, it, it was, it, it met all of my uh, requirements for a second career. Awesome. And quick follow up question in regards to the, the passion of wanting to serve. Where did that come from? Was that something that was instilled in you as a, as a child? Did you have other family in the military? Like, where did that passion come from? Because I do believe that a lot of people do join the military because they want to serve, but everyone doesn't do it. They want to serve different ways. So, like, where did that particular way of serving come from? Well, the, the one interesting thing is that I didn't have a lot of family members that I knew who served. Um, mm -hmm. I had a couple, but that wasn't really... Um, where I got it from, I don't think. Uh, unbeknownst to me before joining, um, my mother and father were service members. Uh, my mother in the Marine Corps and my father in the Air Force. Um, wow. Their paths and careers varied. Uh, they were not together. So um, I, I think part of it is innate. Uh, as well because mm -hmm. of them and and their passions and their uh, um, being driven to serve as well. And that's remained with me, whether it's serving the country, serving the Commonwealth, the, the public 
uh, service aspect of it is, is very important. And particularly in a country where it's an all volunteer uh, force. Yes. Mm-hmm. Excellent. It's a, it's a good point. I mean, uh, just to, I guess, uh, kind of um, take a, a little more further steps back, uh, I believe just from my research that you, you grew up in the Chicago area. Is that is that correct? That's correct. And, 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 and what, what was like that? Well, excuse me, what was that like? Just, you know, your uh, upbringing and I guess, um, is there anything that comes to mind that you think might have contributed uh, significantly to uh, the decisions you've made in terms of getting into law um, and what you pursued professionally? My upbringing in Chicago was, um, I think, re- fairly common for um, sort of poor black folks living in Chicago and growing up there. I grew up in a black neighborhood. I went to a black grammar school and high school and Mm -hmm. um, I sort of had a normal kid in the city, latchkey kid type of upbringing Mm -hmm. um, in a single parent household. So we didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of discipline in my house um, from my mother. And so Mm -hmm. doing what we were supposed to be doing in school that was that was my number one job, and um, and that's the way I saw it as well. The um, great thing about my schooling was that I had fabulous teachers. And when you ask, is there anything that sort of led me to make the decisions I made there, the the teachers at the schools I went to were uh, front and center. In, in those decisions and in the way I went about um, my education and career. The um, teachers in my grammar school and my high school were supportive. Uh, they did everything they could do to push me. Um, I did a lot of extracurricular programs and competitions and things that really uh, take a child outside of the school and competing on a, a district or city or even state level in things like science fairs and history fairs, Um, you know, Shakespeare fair, I did it all. (laughs) So it was, you know, a a fun time um, for me to be in school. So I didn't have a lot in terms of resources, but I had a lot in terms of support. That's awesome. Getting into, you know, at the collegiate level, Ivy League, um, so I guess to provide some context, um, me, Tony, and I have big tech backgrounds. I'm at Google now. Prior to that, I was with Meta, specifically in the Cambridge area, and I did partner with, uh, like, the African American Student Union at Harvard. And I noticed that, uh, you know, just engaging with them, they had a really awesome community, like, on their campus. Um, Was it always like that? Was it like that for you? Did you have that support system when you were attending as well? Absolutely. Uh, Harvard has an amazing um, black student body. And from when I was there, it was a very tight knit community. uh, The entire time I was there. When we visit, I visited the school for what they call pre frosh weekend, um, where admitted students come up uh, for a weekend and sort of figure out that's really where they want to be. And that was my first time in Massachusetts, first time at the school, mm-hmm. and uh, met, got to meet a lot of the black students there and get a feel for what life was like on campus for them. From that moment forward, um, I was hooked and came to the school and joined uh, a, a very close and supportive community. My class um, is one that I, I still am amazed by the people in it and the things that they're doing. Uh, Justice Katanji Brown, who was nominated for the Supreme Court, is my classmate. Oh, wow. That's um, impressive. That level of achievement is is very common um, in in my class and the classes around me, uh, below and above the people that I know. So it it was an amazing uh, 
group of people who are still friends uh, of mine to this day. And um, one of the uh, ab mechanisms that I used for you know my mental health and sanity while while at school was the Kaumba Singers, who um, are a Harvard-based group. Though you don't have to be a student to be one of the singers, it is um, a organization uh, at Harvard that was started in 1970, and it mm -hmm. originally began as a protest organization um, of Black students, but with the focus on singing and uh, mostly Negro spirituals, as we call them, and gospel music, and it remains that to to this day. Um, that group uh, i was in the entire time i was at the school and the last my last year i was the president of the organization and uh, i still have a relationship with the organization i think all kumba alums do essentially no matter where they go so oh. um <clears throat> things like that and the black student union um were invaluable to me while i was going through the undergrad i mean they have the saying that you'd never judge a book by its cover. I would have never assumed that singing, um, everything else based from, you know, first seeing you on LinkedIn when we first connected, um, that you have all of these other passions and, um, maybe one day we can hear you sing. That would be awesome. But, um, <laughs> was Harvard always the immediate choice or was there some other university that you were tackling between the two? Just want to get a sense of that thought process because I'm under the assumption that you probably had acceptance to all the Ivy Leagues, but why Harvard or why Harvard in general? Um, wow, that's a that's a really good question, and, and I don't usually get asked that, but it, it's not what people might think. I, I did not, I did not. That's the only high, Ivy League I applied to. Wow, um, you just took one shot. That's one, 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 one shot. One shot. Um, the other schools I applied to were University of Illinois in Urbana, okay. that um, I was very familiar with from living in Chicago and other programs that the school sponsored that you could take part in as a high schooler. Um, I applied to Oberlin College in, in Ohio. I was interested in the liberal arts education, and that was, it just felt good, like a feel good school. Um, um, I applied to Northwestern. Ah, okay, great, awesome. Even though it, I, I think music is their slant, I, I still just love the love the program. What I learned about it, um, Northwestern, as well, which you know is the location alone. Um, I would have gone to that school right on the water uh, there in Chicago or in Evanston rather, um, and I. And, and Harvard was my long shot. So um, it, you know, it wasn't my, I wasn't dead set on entering an Ivy League, mm -hmm. but as school progressed, it became clear that I was gonna be the valedictorian. There were 461 people at my high school in, in the senior class. Wow, that's and, a big, school, big um, class. It's, it's a big class and it's a big class to sort of, you know, be at the top of. But if you recall AP courses, you can get uh, more than an A in an AP course, you know, more yeah. than 4.0. And so that can greatly add to your um, your GPA and, and allow me to, to do very well. And the, um, you know, it was, it was sort of overwhelming to be applying to schools. You know, you, you have a whole country at your disposal. And, mm -hmm. You know, you have to decide whether you want to sort of stay home or go abroad. You have to decide what type of program you want. And then it's nerve wracking, sort of sitting around waiting as kids are right now on what school um, they're going to mm -hmm. schools they're going to get into. So it, it wasn't um, a, a plan that, OK, these, my, these are my steps to get to some point and Ivy League is, is the first step or one of the steps. But it did become um, clear that this was, you know, to me that I should go to the highest ranking school that I got into. 
And makes sense. It's essentially what I advise young people today, whether they're applying to college or graduate schools, law school, you know, to choose your school by first, can you can you stand to be in that location based on mm-hmm. whether it's a city or it's country or it's hot or it's cold? And then um, you should probably go to the highest school you get into, the highest ranking school you get into. And that's what I did. So once I had gotten into those schools, um, mm-hmm. it, it was a foregone conclusion that I was going to go to Harvard. Got it. Okay. I guess one follow-up question on that topic. As you think back at think back now, do you think you would have done things slightly different, maybe apply to a few more Ivy League schools, or you <laughs> felt the path you chose was the right path? I may have, if I, if I were to do it again, I may have applied to some others just to um, better the odds and, and increase my options. Mm-hmm. Um, but... I do think that applying to, um, okay, some some schools that you pretty much know you can get into, some schools where you should get into, but you don't really know, and then some schools that are mm-hmm. long shots. I think um, some combination of those is a really good idea for folks applying to schools at any level. Got it. Okay. One thing, uh, and, you know, I, you know, full disclaimer, I didn't go to uh, Ivy League college, but our university. Likewise. Graduating from school, you know, getting into the professional field and networking with other folks, especially folks who looked like me, um, who had had the opportunity to attend an HBCU, uh, made me think like, uh, essentially, if I could do college over, I I would, uh, I think I would have went to an HBCU just to experience that. Mm -hmm. Um, I I guess, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, historically black uh, colleges or universities, uh, do you think that, uh, you know, more of us should, I guess, strive to, to get into those universities? Or do you think, uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish professionally, it might benefit you to, you know, be in a more diverse environment? I guess I've heard a lot of uh, kind of uh, mixed opinions on that. I'm, I'm curious what your what your thoughts are. I, you know, I, I don't have... Um, both sets of schooling to sort of compare personally. My sister did go to an HBCU. Um, She went to Alcorn in Mississippi. And um, other friends and um, family have gone to HBCU. So I have some familiarity with the programs and people's experiences. I think that decision is so uniquely personal. It's just like um, whether you would go to California or not uh, from the East Coast. It just, some people are, oh my God, first thing smoking, I need to be on it. And other people never leave their hometown. Um, And Mm -hmm. I don't think it's um, necessarily uh, an issue about how, how prepared you are for the world. I have had those discussions with people. And I think, uh, for the most part, college is college. You know, you, you're, you're furthering your education, you're studying a particular topic, you're coming out with a degree. And you know, whether you want to be around people who look like you for that four year period, or you want to go somewhere where the campus is more diverse, um, I just think that's a really personal decision. I don't really have a, a blanket opinion on it. Um, HBCUs are awesome. And, uh, you know, to me, the point is, Go, go to school, <laughs> which whatever kind. That's a good pick. point. It can be HBCU and be a community college. It can be a trade school. Just get some education. I think that's a good point. And to cut, continue on the education part, tell us a little bit about your journey through Georgetown. Um, I've had friends that, you know, gone through the law program and had to take their bar exam more than once. Was that your case? Did you knock it out the park the first time? We'd love to hear that journey. Well, I don't know about knocking it out of the park, but I did pass it the first time. But it's it's one of those exams. I'll take it. A a, a W is a W. Um, W is a W. It's one of those exams that's just bizarre and inapplicable to anything else in life, really. And I often tell people that uh, students believe, you know, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I got to get 
take the LSAT to get into law school, and then that's going to determine how well I do in law school, and how well in law school is going to determine what I do on the bar, and how well I do on the bar is going to determine how good a lawyer I am. And absolutely none of those are true. And wow. the way I explain it usually is that they're all separate events uh, that don't really have much to do with each other. You've got to do them all to get to the point of practicing law, but they're totally separate and your performance on one doesn't really have anything to do with how you will do in the next event. So <clears throat> um, the, you know, the bar exam itself, there are many people who have to take it more than once. There are two parts to it. One is a multiple choice, which I think generally people like, but this multiple choice is not very likable. Um, it's a type of exam where more than one answer can be correct. <laughs> um, and it's more I hate those. a judgment call uh, than anything else. And then there are essays on substantive law topics. So it's a it's a it's a bear. Um, it's a two day exam. Some states maybe three days, like California, I believe. But um, it it's you know like all uh, professional exams, it's it's a bear and it's its own event that you just got to get through. So the you know my time at Georgetown was fantastic. Another big school and with another large population of Black students. Um, who are very tight. I participated in Black Law Students Association. I also participated in Georgetown Outreach, which is an umbrella um, organization that's really geared towards volunteer uh, uh, students and, and faculty volunteering in the public sector at homeless shelters, uh, domestic violence shelters, um, in, in all sorts of, you know, uh, food banks and, and things of that nature. And the Georgetown Outreach basically coordinates those efforts for the school. So it was my first time uh, living in DC, which I love that area and uh -huh. um, would definitely not have done that any differently. Um, I was there between 92 and 95 and during that time, even though most people are uh, going to school, per eventually participating in interviewing where uh -huh. firms come to the school and interview students for summer positions and uh, students hoping that those summer positions turn into uh, full-time positions when they graduate. I did not do any of that because I was already um, a Marine and I already knew that I was going on active duty. So I didn't need a summer job that was going to lead to a firm job and actually really didn't want that either. So um, I spent my summers teaching tennis. So, you know, that it was sort of the best of both worlds. I'm going to school the majority of the year and spend the summer in shorts on a tennis court um, teaching adults. Um, uh, children in the daytime and adults in the evening in Chicago. So uh, the my time in law school was awesome. I was in an experimental program at Georgetown that focused on things. Uh, funny how things come full circle. Circle. We focused on things like feminist theory, critical race theory, um, and big topics today. Yes, things that um, weren't really as controversial at the time when we were studying, but we had um, a different focus. It was called Section 3, and I think it's still going on, and that, that section does a little bit more than black letter law um, for the first for their first year. So I, I had a, a great uh, law school experience. Amazing. Anything that comes to well, what would you say was, I guess, uh, the biggest obstacle uh, while you were in, in, aside from the load of studying, I'd imagine you'd have to do, but um, just kind of uh, juggling uh, 
being young in school and uh, other folks who maybe might not be as focused as you, uh, you know, partying, doing all sorts of stuff. I mean, how did you kind of balance, I guess, the, the workload of being a law student in your personal life and keeping your goals in mind? Well, the the schools, um, both schools, undergrad and law school that I went to, the folks who went to those schools were pretty, pretty serious, pretty dedicated to um, their work there and their education and what they were there for. So I can't say that I had very much um, peer pressure in a negative sense. Uh, most of the people that I was around were uh, just as goal oriented as I was, and perhaps different goals, but um, people were were pretty focused. So, but but clearly, um, you know, you're, you're still young. I was in my twenties. I'm in D.C. I'm in the Marine Corps. I have you know uh, family in other parts of the country. So it there, you know, and you're you're juggling all of that. You uh, love life and whatever else is going on. Um, but I think that, you know, in your 20s, you, you got all that energy. You, you, can, you can do that pretty well. Um, you can cram for exams. You can stay up all night and then still go somewhere. I can't even stay up till 9 o'clock and, and be coherent before 7. Um, <laughs> that's changed a great deal. But I think, um, you know, in, in, I tell people in their 20s, you know, don't waste it being in one place, go as many places as you can before you get tied down to one place. And in tied down, I mean, spouse, children, things that kind of plant you in a particular city or state. Yeah, um, before sense. that, you should explore all of the wanderlust that you have and, and try all of the uh, studies and, and things that you want to learn how to do or experiment. And um, I consider my path to be like that. And, um, and I didn't really see anything in my way. I, I wanted to leave Chicago um, at that time and, and go to Harvard. I wanted to leave Boston and, and experience DC and Georgetown. I wanted to be in the Marine Corps. So, you know, none of the things that I did were, were forced on me. And I really didn't feel that um, anything was blocking me from doing gotcha. my best um, at each okay. point. It sounds like you really didn't have like a balancing act of like balancing school and the Marine Corps at the same time. I felt like you were very much in control of what you were doing, it sounds like. Well, the Marine Corps, um, the, the program is such that um, I came in as a judge advocate. So if you're in law school or you are a mm -hmm. lawyer already, you can apply to the judge advocate program, which I did and was accepted into. And so when that happens, um, the Marine Corps requires that you pass a bar exam, oh, whatever state okay. you want, before you go on to the basic school and then go out into the what we used to call the fleet uh, Marine Force and work, whatever your work uh, station would be. So I when I took the, when I joined the Marine Corps, I was still in school. So what they essentially do is that the summer between my second year and my third year is when I went to officer candidate school and became a Marine and was commissioned as an officer by the end of that summer. But because I was still in school, what they do is they commission you and then release you um, from duty on the same day so that you can go and finish school. So you don't have to do any weekend service or report anywhere while you're finishing law school. And got then it, you don't got it. come back to come on to active duty again until you've passed the bar, at which point you go on to the basic school. So it's kind of a long winding course to get out there and, and start working in the Marine Corps, but um, all the training is definitely needed. Got it. And that's good information for our, our viewers because I was under some you were like actively doing both at the same time, but it makes sense the way you explained it. Yeah, they do. They do give you time to get your schooling down, um, and and focus on that before you know you come out and 
do any combat training and, and war fighting. So got it. It's, it's, it's logical. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. So, uh, you know, in, in the United States or I guess in the world, in the past two years, it's been uh, uh, quite eventful. Um, but uh, in the United States in particular, uh, I guess, uh, what would you say or how do you feel the state of our justice system is right now? The state of our justice system. Well, that's a big question. It is um, <clears throat> clearly a topic. It's, it's a, a, an industry that's being scrutinized right now. I think um, you know, this is my 13th year on the bench. I, I've, I've been talking about race and bias and diversity and disparities since I've been practicing, I think, and, and, and on the bench. But it hasn't really taken on, hasn't really become a national focus until the murder of George Floyd. And whether you think that makes sense or not and, and understand why it happened that way or not, it it has coincided with that and it has become um, sort of a reckoning, as, as I call it, for the entire country mm -hmm. uh, to take a hard look at itself and its race relations and the disparities in particular in the criminal justice system. And... Um, just over the past couple of years, Massachusetts in particular has been looking at our own statistics because up here, you know, we this is a blue state, uh, as they call it. It's uh, very liberal in terms of policies and direction. Um, and I think in this type of state, we get a little arrogant, like, oh, we're, we're good to go on race and bias and diversity. Um, but that's not really the case. And we've learned that still in Massachusetts, uh, black and brown people um, receive higher bails imposed by courts than white defendants, and that black and brown defendants uh, receive higher sentences at the end of cases than their white counterparts with all other things being controlled for. So now that this has come out in an official uh, Harvard study uh, analyzing our numbers and our stats, we can we have been able to sort of move from the um, sort of agnostic. We don't we don't know if this is really the case because we only have anecdotal evidence to now being uh -huh. sort of smacked fully in the head with all of the data and and say, all right, this isn't these aren't numbers from. Mississippi or Alabama or Florida or any other state you might badmouth from from the from the uh -huh. northeast. This is from Massachusetts, and these aren't numbers from the 1940s. These are numbers from the 2000s um, uh -huh. that we're dealing with. Those disparities are ongoing, and as judges on the superior court that handle all people who are indicted on crimes, so the most serious of crimes. Um, rapes, robbery, murder, what I call blue collar crimes, we, we are the judges creating those statistics. And it has uh -huh. caused us to really look hard at what we do, why we do it, um, and what changes we can make. And we're sort of, this is a big work in progress and it's still happening on a daily basis where we're at least trying to get better at it. But, you know, I tell people often, courts are some of the hardest institutions to change and the they are steeped in tradition and um and judges mm -hmm. some of the hardest people <laughs> to change how they do business because judges think they know everything for the most part and certainly know our business but we have been discovering things about how we do business and the disparities that those processes create and the decisions that we make create the disparities. And it, we, we're looking at ourselves in the mirror right now about that. I know in a podcast that you did in the past, you mentioned about um, bail limits that are being set for minorities versus non-minorities are very different. 
could you provide any context around that? Like, I know you mentioned that, you know, for black crime, like the bail is normally set a lot higher or they aren't given bail. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Sure. And that's part of what I was just, um, just talking about in the statistics that have come out the, um, in, in general, in, in Massachusetts, the, um, amount of bail, say, say there's a drug case, uh, that we have lots of trafficking in fentanyl or something of that nature. Um, the statistics bear out that in general, uh, black or brown defendants, people of color, um, the judge will impose higher bail on those people, not because it's a rule or being done consciously, but because of implicit bias. Um, mm-hmm. And implicit bias is something that even judges are, we are now learning anew. So when you go onto the internet and you type in implicit bias test or study, um, and you can come up with the Harvard one, and the schools, where there, there's so many of them. And you just look, you go through the exercises, you'll see that um, there's so many um, contexts in which darker skin and more African features are a negative and have a negative impact on the outcomes. Mm-hmm. And that is um, both saddening and astonishing to me that that is still the case in 2022. Wow. And um, so that's a part of what's going on in those bail disparities. Gotcha. And one quick follow up, and then I'll let Dervin ask another question. And I think this is an interesting question to ask because, um, you know, one of the ways I was introduced to you was on LinkedIn. You had posted a picture of showing um, the KISS sign from the KISS band, and that was interpreted incorrectly that you were throwing up gang signs. And I don't know if it's a combination because you have tattoos that are visible. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about, you know, those type of stigmas that, you know, are in the, the law field in general and within the criminal justice field in general? Sure, that was um, something that I discussed in a LinkedIn post and um, have sort of openly discussed in other contexts as well when talking about implicit bias. The uh, post was a photo of of myself. It was just a selfie, uh, a lighthearted selfie Mm -hmm. um, from when I was um, on the bench, but I was on the Boston Municipal Court um, sitting in Roxbury. And from my lobby, uh, took a selfie doing the, um, you know, the, the kiss sign and with the tongue out and uh, sort of a, you know, lighthearted tribute to, to that group in those days. Great group. And, um, yeah. And I think most people got it and laughed at it and, and that was how it was meant. But someone uh, looked at it and notified my chief, the chief of the court that I serve on and said that they thought I was throwing gang signs on um, social media. And that was, ended up being something that that chief discussed with me and asked about. And when we talked about it, I was at work and I had work in my session, so I couldn't dwell on it all day, but it certainly bothered me enough to write back um, where, where I thought the, the source of that type of comment, assumption, and sort of tattletaling um, even was, what, what, what I thought the source was. Um, and, you know, sort of had a conversation about uh, being one of two Black judges on this court of 85 or so um, wow. judges and being uh, tattooed and being outspoken about race and bias and implicit bias and how those things played into people sort of um, watching me and trying to report things about me a lot um, because they don't like sort of what I stand for and how I represent the court. And we had, a, I thought, a fruitful conversation about that and, and it ended there. But obviously, it's one of those things that stuck with me. And it's not the first time that I've been assumed to be a gang member since I've been a lawyer. I mean, it just, it's just been 
um, appalling the assumptions that people make. And of course, um, adding to skin color or tattoos have their own uh, stereotypes and the you must mm -hmm. be a criminal, you must be a gangbanger, you must be something wrong with you, you must be a biker, you must be a uh, something. You can't just um, like body art. <laughs> um, that, that That's where it ends, I think, with tattoos. So the uh, those types of lessons, I think, um, are ones that I've been willing to share as opposed to keeping that to myself and only my friends and family knowing I've chosen to share those experiences because people coming onto the bench, people coming into the practice of law, people just growing up in America, I think, um, should be aware that the effects of bias never stop. It doesn't matter how quote unquote high up you go or what position you take over or what role in the world you play. Um, you're going to experience and witness bias, at, particularly as a person of color. And, I, and, and my experience is no different. I appreciate you sharing that because that really resonated with me. And I shared a story about something very similar that happened to me in a few, a, a, in one of my employments in the past. Um, and mm -hmm. having you speak out about it gave me the courage to speak out about it because I was appalled that this person would even say that, like looking at the accolades, your accomplishments, I'm like, would you really think she would do something like that? But and that, yeah, that was the part that really, you know, by then I'd been on the bench at least 10 years when that happened. Um, you know, I've been appointed to two different courts. Uh, you know, I'm a known quantity, uh, particularly in Massachusetts. Um, gang membership really is not a part of the story anywhere. And so, it, it, I had the same reaction that me, why would you think I, you know, why would you, why would that even come to mind? Exactly. Knowing, knowing who I am and what I do. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's crazy. But I mean, how do we, how do we overcome that? You know, uh, it, it sounds like our community, uh, you know, local greater local or greater diaspora would benefit from more representation in law at all levels. Um, how, do, how do we, I don't know, I, I, I apologize. I guess I'm trying to, to formulate the words or the question in the best way, but I guess how would you say uh, we promote or inspire, uh, especially folks in the younger generation, like who, who might be listening, you know, teens considering what to go to school for, someone in school might be thinking of changing a major or transferring. Like how do we uh, encourage folks to, to look at law as not just a, a great opportunity, but a necessity for, for more representation in our community? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I don't pretend to know um, exactly how we do that. I can say that the way I try to do it, um, I, I talk to so many students, uh, whether they are high school students. Just this week, I had a high school class from Pomfret, uh, the Pomfret School in Connecticut uh, visit my session, and we talked extensively about uh, criminal law and criminal justice. I talked to students who are in college uh, thinking about law school, encouraging them to do that. I talked to students who are thinking about military service, and I talked to law students about career paths, and and I talked to lawyers about coming onto the bench. So I think part of it is, um, you know, we every industry talks about networking. You've got to network, yeah. and you've got to go to these events, and you've got to join these associations. And some of it may seem like you know, sort of old-fashioned advice, and and not really applicable to today. But the reality is you really do have to um, put yourself in spaces to meet and know as many people as possible and have them know you. Mm -hmm. And the conversations between the bench and the bar, let's say, so the lawyers and the judges, it just has to be so much more broad and, and 
continuous, it, you know, mm -hmm. one-off programs, you know, once a year between the bench and the bar. Don't really cut it. We need to have a, a, an ongoing relationship with lawyers from the bench. And I think the onus is on us as judges to, to create that, not on the lawyers. Um, and that is something that we are working on now on the Superior Court, uh, the Superior Court's Race and Bias Committee is forging those relationship with affinity relationships with affinity bar groups, uh, mass black lawyers, uh, mass black women, um, LGBTQ bar, you know, all sorts of bar associations that, um, or what we call affinity groups that, you know, should and, and, and can have direct access to um, judges who are from those same underrepresented communities. And so that more people um, go to law school, more people go and practice at firms and practice across the spectrum of law so that we're impacting it in every angle, at every angle, and more people coming on the bench who are people from underrepresented groups, whether we're people of color, people on the LGBTQ spectrum, people with disabilities. They're all different classes of underrepresented people. And the, the more dialogue we have, you know, the <clears throat> traditional role of the judge, you're sort of sitting on this perch, looking down, you know, upon people and, and giving out directives. And I think um, the more modern version of the judge is one who is much more accessible to the public uh, so that the public is better educated and so that the bench is better educated um, about the real world and the communities that we serve. You, know, mm. you can't serve a community if you don't know what's going on in that community. That's and a good point. So I think the open dialogue is the beginning of what um, will open minds to doing this type of work, law enforcement, probation officer work, clerks. There's so many uh, ways to be a part of the criminal justice system. And I just, I think we're on a good path right now that has been opened up by this reckoning, as I call it, um, and looking at these issues. And I just think we have to stay the course and not let it be a fad that fades out in a year or two. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the networking piece, I totally agree. I think uh, it goes a long way. And uh, seeing, seeing folks who look like you or might have a similar story as you in a role you didn't know you had access to uh, definitely has a significant impact. Uh, man, that certainly had an impact on me you know, getting into it's a big tech. And um, I think mm -hmm. my, you know, some of my siblings as well. I have two older brothers, one in my PD, one in the sheriff. Uh, and I, I think that's what happened to them, you know, seeing folks in, in that role look like them and they didn't think they had access to it. So it's awesome to hear that. Yes. Awesome. So I have a two part question. Um, I think I'll start with, I know you mentioned about the, the current time that we're in. I know there's a lot about black lives matter, defunding the police. Like what could we do to come find a middle ground where we can all coexist together and really have an impact? Any thoughts about that? Or what education is needed then? What education is needed? Um, it, there's so much education that is needed. This is one of my pet peeves, actually, being a citizen of the United States, is that mm -hmm. the older I get, the more I realize that we don't know our history. We don't know the history of this country, let alone the history of the rest of the world and how, how ours fits into it. And I think that is so, so tragic because we find ourselves where, you know, the current state of race relations, say, in a city or in a neighborhood, um, is taken by a lot of people as in, in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Oh, you people are doing this and these people are doing that and every, you just need to do better. And, it, you know, without knowing the history of that people, of that city, that neighborhood, and mm -hmm. how it got to be um, where it is today, you, you, can't, you can't even have an opinion or formulate a plan. And, you know, if we were right now um, thinking of entering 
um, uh, uh, Russian citizens because of what's going on in the world, it would be good to know that we tried that with Japanese citizens before um, in this country. And mm -hmm. it was horrible and should never be done. I mean, these are things that I think just as, as facts, um, you, you have to know as an adult in this country. Mm -hmm. And there's so much about the country that has been purposely hidden um, and, and still to this day. Uh, attempts to hide what, what the real history is. And yeah. that is something I think will put us miles ahead of where we are now. If people really understand um, history, even though I'm a government major and went into law, at this point, I believe that history is really the only viable major <laughs> that, that you can have. Um, Got it. And, and I, if I went back to school, I, I'd be a history major. I, I love that you, you said that. Um, I, I'd consider myself a, a big history buff. I love history. I think I get that from yes, he is. Uh, my father and my upbringing. And uh, one thing, uh, my big, one of my biggest takeaways from him, uh, still to this day in our conversations, is that you know when you know your history, uh, he'll, he, says it's, he says this to me at least, when you know your history, you can't be fooled. Um, and also, yeah. you know, uh, there's this, this sense of self-value and confidence that you carry uh, when, you're, when you're more aware of that. And um, I think uh, right. our, yeah, our community, Absolutely. Is, we need that right now more than ever. Absolutely. We are more than the block we grew up on and the things that have happened on that block. Uh -huh. um, and it, it it is amazing to note, you know, if you just strike up a conversation with, with someone that you know or don't know about a topic from history, and it can be totally from this country, and just witness, say, in a room of people, the varying levels of knowledge on that topic, where you might think everyone would be sort of on an equal playing field if they're uh -huh. all roughly the same age. And that's really not the case, at least not, at least not here. So I'm a big proponent of um, education, and within that, history, um, particularly for Americans. Yeah, I agree. And um, Durbin, I, I, I'm going to try to say the phrase correctly, hopefully I say it correctly. You mentioned that history is normally written by the winners, not the losers. So it's always important to do your research That's and right. make sure that you're getting the full picture. But with that being said, um, I had another question in regards to incarceration. Um, incarceration in the United States is probably the highest in the entire world, from my understanding. It is. Mm -hmm. Incarceration in the United States is like a business. They're like private companies that spit up prisons and all these different things. Is there, if there could be something that could be changed, would it would it be removing it as a business? Would that reduce incarceration, do you think? Uh, just want your thoughts about incarceration in general. That's what how my head is kind of throwing. I don't have um, I don't have an opinion about the the privatization um, of of prisons. This it's not something I've studied. It's not something that I've compared mm -hmm. in any significant way myself. We we are the most incarcerated country. I would like for that to change. I, I don't know anyone who wouldn't like for that to change where we differ is on how to, how to make that different. Um, yeah. So how can we make that different? It would be great. The, it, I think it's, it's a cultural change. Mm -hmm. um, in this country, you know, we, we watch the news every day. Someone is suspected of a crime. Our initial thought is up, oh, they're going to go to jail, go to prison. And that's really the main tool that we have here for people um, committing crimes is, is in, that's, that's the main tool. And we have other tools. We have probation, we have programs, um, we have boot camps, we have uh, diversion programs. There are other ways to uh, deal with criminal behavior, but incarceration is still our main, our main tool. And whether it's pretrial, um, after trial, after probation violations, 
uh, one of the interesting things is here, at least more people go to jail on probation violations than they do from original sentencing on crimes. I was going to ask a question about that because mm -hmm. I know Meek Mill talks about it all the time that you could be in probation for five years and you drop a piece of paper, maybe not extreme, but he just mentioned that the probation system is so geared to make you fail that it's not really geared to make you succeed. Is that correct or not really? Um, the, I don't know that it's geared to make you fail, but I think that within the system, mm -hmm. uh, judges, probation officers, prosecutors, we have to be very mindful that the point is not to get people in the system and then just keep them running around on the in the on the track for the rest of their lives mm -hmm. the point is to get if when people come into the system to correct the behavior um and then get them back out to their lives into being productive citizens and family members um we don't the goal is is shouldn't be for people to be locked up forever yeah. however we continue to see more incarceration, longer incarceration, mandatory incarceration as the answer. Um, and I'm not sure that that's panning out to be true. And so yeah. I try to focus on the whole person when people come before me and not on, all right, it's this crime, that equals this sentence. You don't need judges if that's going to be the, the calculation. Anybody can do that. Um, but the point is to fashion sentencing that makes sense for the crime, the situation, the person, the goals. Because retribution is not the only goal of sentencing. Rehabilitation is a goal of sentencing. Deterrence is a goal of sentencing. Um, so to the extent that you know, I think that in this country, we we move at a rate that the whole country can stomach. And if, if, there, if there's some part of the, with the population who's going to be very upset, those things happen more slowly, even when they need to happen. And I Got think um, taking the focus off of incarceration and onto other ways of addressing criminal conduct is one of those things, because traditionally, it just, it's just American to send people to jail. It's a very American way of doing business. And certainly as a judge, I have imposed many sentences of incarceration. But I try to um, grow, and judges aren't stagnant, we grow as well, uh -huh. and do better than that alone. That may have to occur depending on the case and the circumstances, but that can't be the only answer. And, and, and jail is not the right answer for everyone. And jail is not the right answer for everything that occurs um, in, in the criminal sense. So it's a, it's a deep conversation. It takes a really hard look at ourselves and, and why we are so into incarceration as a, com as a country. Um, and that's hard work and it's definitely a work in progress in Massachusetts and everywhere else. Got it. Just to take a nab at history, uh, foundationally, this complex that the country has developed um, when it comes to our prison system uh, may have stemmed from uh, what I consider a loophole in our, our 13th Amendment, uh, uh, saying that uh, essentially, uh, essentially section one says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime. So the, the premise of the the premise of the documentary, yeah, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that's the premise of the thirteen. Yeah. Do you think that there would be or could be an opportunity for that amendment to be revisited in our lifetime? I don't think it's impossible. Um, I think all all parts of our laws, even constitutional provisions, um, can always be revisited. Now. Mm -hmm. Of course, changes uh, to the Constitution are uh, carry great weight and are very difficult. It's very, it's not a, it's not a regular statute. It's not a regular law uh, uh -huh. that just a legislature can change, and, it, and it's meant to be hard to change. 
Mm-hmm. It's, it's written to be hard to change. So I, I don't think it's impossible. But like everything else, um, there's got to be sort of a public and political appetite to change it. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. got to be something that unites us to on action. make that kind of change. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's, that's an interesting uh, question. And we're, we're so far into the incarceration wheel now, you know, I, it, it, it is probably debatable whether the constitutional change will, will have that, will have an effect yeah. on those numbers or the, or the effect that, that you would be after. Gotcha. So I know we're in the month of um, Women History Month, and I know we're coming up to time. Um, I know there are about, I think, if I remember correctly, 750 incarcerated women across the globe for nonviolent crimes. And I feel that the the prison system, when it comes to women, is very not set up for their success after prison. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and the challenges of being a woman in prison or being incarcerated? Um, share some light on that. The, uh, you know, the, the plight of women and uh, women in the criminal justice system in particular, I think, is one that needs a lot more focus. There are many programs um, for men and women that uh, focus on post-incarceration uh-huh. assistance. And... Um, the part of the part of the issue is the the traditional roles of women in the country and in the society uh, may make it harder to sort of come out of a prison setting and and be successful. You may have children. You know, you're more likely to have children that you are the caretaker for. And in fact, in Massachusetts. Um, one of our laws changed to require judges to consider if a woman or or a man is the primary caretaker for children when considering whether to incarcerate them. So it doesn't mean you have to uh, not uh, put them in jail or prison, but it does mean you have to at least think about the effect of that on that family and that uh, neighborhood and community. I think that's a great reform. That's a it, it it's a really um, forward looking uh, type of change that you know I don't know how many other states uh, require it but the point I think is that it acknowledges um, something that has always been the case people who go to jail may have children that are left. Uh, by the wayside or left with other caregivers because of that. But I think for women in particular, you know, you you have seen sort of specials and documentaries that talk about women who get involved in the system because of their partners. Um, and I think that's a phenomenon and a, um, uh, something that is common enough to be publicly acknowledged as as an issue and one that we we have to work on with the women who are being released because if you end up it's just like any uh man for that reason if you end up around the same people then uh your circumstances may not change that much and you may actually end up back in the same um detention that you were coming out of so i think that um Particularly, and I talked about this recently, programs that focus on empowering girls um, through many things like sports, like the military, um, any any programs that don't um, cater to this concept of joining someone to get what you want in the world, but Mm -hmm. actually being the person. Um, who is going after what you want in the world and opening up the world to girls in the way that it was opened to me. You know, I I thought that I could play sports. I thought that I could go away to school. I thought that I could be successful and take care of myself. So no matter my love life, um, I, I was still doing what I was doing regardless. 
And I think that that kind of That's training with, with, with younger girls is really important in keeping women out of the system altogether. Great answer. So uh, one thing uh, we tend to ask all of our guests um, is essentially, uh, you know, we, we focused on, you know, engaging and, and talking to like really impactful people in their respective spaces. Um, when you are, you know, doing what you do uh, and trying to stay focused and, and sometimes you might, you know, deal with implicit bias, you know, some type of scrutiny. Uh, how do you block out the noise, and, you know, stay focused? And uh, you, you mentioned staying sane earlier. You know, I, I guess you know, the, the mental health and you know, staying focused on your goals and just blocking out distractions or hate. Uh, how do you do that? It's a lot of work. <laughs> it, it, it is a lot of work, and I don't pretend to have mastered it. But I try to stay focused on... Um, what I call my real life. So, you know, my life with my fiance, my life with my mother and sister and my family in Mississippi, um, my life with all of my friends um, who I graduated from college with or have known across so many parts of my life, other Marines, you know, I consider that to be my real life, the people who know and love me and who I know and love and copious amounts of downtime in those settings, I think is, is just uh, essential to um, blocking out the noise, as you call it, and, and really staying focused because um, there, there is a lot of hate and we have seen a lot of hate expressed in the world a lot more, I think, in the last few years than I had seen sort of in my younger years. And that, uh, I think, along with other things that have happened to the, to the world, like the pandemic, um, they've taken their toll. I think those things take their toll. And um, lots of downtime in your real life and amongst the people who know and love you, I think, is just... That's that's my personal um, recipe. So, you know, if things are just off the rails, um, I, I may go away. I may go to my house in Mississippi, go to where things are moving a little slower. Yeah. Um, you know, people have known me since I was spitting up Cheerios. Um, and... Um, and you can actually gain some more, gain your perspective back. Yeah. And your, you know, perspective is 100% um, for, in terms of blocking out the noise and staying focused. It's all your perspective. Excellent, excellent. And I guess the last thing to wrap this up is, um, you know, how can people learn more about your story? Like, what's the next big thing that people should keep an eye out for? Anything that a listener should be aware of. <laughs> There, you know, um, I, I am very uh, in touch with the public and students and lawyers through so many organizations, but also just on social media, which is one of the, the good things. There are good and bad things about social media, but I think that's been one of the good things is that um, outfits like LinkedIn, um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, allow for people to share at such, so, so much easier and so much more quickly and in so many different ways now, more than ever. Mm -hmm. um, so you can certainly uh, find out more about me on those mediums. And I'm basically Judge Fryson, I think, across all of them. So it's pretty easy to find. Um, so in terms of the next big thing, there, there there's so many next big things. Uh, the literal next big thing is uh, Future Lawyer Week in New York City uh, next Monday and Tuesday, which is a um, uh, legal tech conference that I will be chairing on those two days. So, um, if you're in the area, uh, say hi. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. All right. 
thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we greatly appreciate it.